you have your Bibles open with you, you can turn to the book of Ruth. <laughs> Just a quick shout out to Anne and to Yuna. Um, this is one of their favorite books. In fact, Yuna texted me. She asked what chapter I was preaching on this morning. And when I said chapter 3, she said that's one of her favorite in the scriptures. Can you hit the next button and put them all up? There you go. I hope all of you can read that. <laughs> we, we have seven Korean students with us this morning. And um, in the Korean language, um, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between a character and a letter or uh, a Korean um, idea and a English word. Um, the characters really um, are more pictures than they are a correspondence to our alphabet. And so sometimes when you read in Korean, it paints a picture for you in a way that the English words don't. And so I thought I'd put up the Korean words, but um, it's the story that, that it tells is the exact same story here, okay? So I'll read it in English, but I can follow along. Can I read that? No. But Sumi and Lucy and Yeji and everybody else can. So that's the reason. So we're on page 278, and I'll be reading 1 through 11. So let me begin with verse 1. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? <laughs> Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, <coughs> note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. Next slide. <coughs> in the middle of the night, something startled the man, Boaz, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are my kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. But now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All my fellow townsmen know you are a woman of normal, noble character. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, as we come to your word this morning, this is your word. This is your revelation to us. You want us to know you. You want us to understand who we are and what you've done for us in giving us Jesus. So as we talk about this particular story and this passage in Scripture, give our minds and our hearts understanding. We ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I should point out to you that some people, when they read the book of Ruth, see this as a love story of how a man and a woman meet and how they fall in love. But the story of Ruth, and in particular, this very tantalizing chapter, 
is not a love story. At least not in the way that we here in the West think of love stories. There is deep love in this story. Obviously, there's love between Ruth and Naomi. I will go where you will go. Your God will be my God. And there's a love between Boaz and Ruth that we begin to see here. But if that's all you see, then you, we haven't looked deep enough. This is a story about the love of God for you and me. When we come to chapter 3, it's very easy to look at this chapter and get caught up in all the details. Naomi and all of her sort of trying to manage and play matchmaker. Ruth sneaking into the threshing floor late at night. The romance of uncovered feet. The midnight hour. In fact, if you're like me, when you read this for the first time or many, many years ago or even this morning, you're probably asking yourself, of, as I've asked myself, what in the world is going on here? Because a lot we don't understand because of the differences of culture that we hope to unearth this morning. Chapter 3 is without doubt the most challenging chapter in the book of Ruth. But it's arguably the most helpful chapter in the book of Ruth. It's filled with some moral ambiguities, but it also shows us God's mercy towards sinners. It shows us the good news of the gospel, a gospel of grace. It shows us ourselves, and it shows us Jesus. Now, let me give you a small aside here. <clears throat> When you come to the Old Testament, the Old Testament is filled with stories. And those stories contain images of the grace of God through Jesus on every single page. We make a mistake, particularly here in America. We make a mistake when we take stories like the story of Jonah, the story of, of Daniel, the story of Joseph, the story of David and Goliath, the story of Esther, the story of David and Jonathan, and we turn them into simple stories that teach morals, that teach how we should do this and how we should not do this and what a better way to do this might be. These are not stories that are ultimately about teaching morale and what to do and what not to do. These stories and every story that you find in the Old Testament are stories of redemption, of how God is working to redeem us. So in the story of Ruth and Boaz, the reader is going to come face to face with the gospel, the good news that Jesus redeems, that Jesus saves. It's an unfolding of the promise that we were given in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 3.15, where God says to Adam and Eve, and he makes them a promise, that from you one day there will be a seed, and from that seed will come one who will crush the head of the serpent, Satan. That was God's promise to Adam and Eve back in the garden that he was going to provide a redeemer. And so the Old Testament is sort of the unfolding bit by bit of how God is going to make this happen. And the story of Daniel, the story of David, the story of Ruth are all stories about the unfolding of God's plan to redeem you and I through Jesus. Very interesting. Jesus, after he had risen from the dead, he's walking along the road to Emmaus, Emmaus and he's talking to his disciples who first don't recognize who he is. And he wonders why they don't recognize him. And he says to them in Luke chapter 24, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What he was teaching them was helping them to understand that the Old Testament was all about Jesus. It was pointing them to Jesus. So when we say that the Bible is redemptive historical, we mean that the Bible is a history book. 
but it's not a normal history book. It's the story of redemption. It's telling the story of how God is going to redeem us. And that means the story of Ruth is our story because we hear in a fresh way, in a beautiful account, the gospel and God's love for sinners. Now, quick review. Chapter 1. We were struck by the bitterness of God's providence in Naomi's life. Naomi and Elimelech, her husband, were living in Bethlehem. A famine had came to Bethlehem. Elimelech, in his own thinking, said, I need to protect my family. I need to go to the land of Moab to protect them where there's food. And so even though God had forbidden that they go to Moab, which was a pagan nation, Elimelech takes Naomi and their two sons, and they go to Moab. And when they do that, they have food. But Elimelech dies, and her two sons, who had married Moabite women, which they were not to do, also die. And so at the end of the chapter, Naomi is overwhelmed by the fact that God is acting so harshly towards her that we talked about the bitterness of God's providence. And she says at the end of the chapter, the Almighty has dealt with me very, very bitterly. I don't understand what God is doing. In chapter 2, we see something of the mercy of God. We introduced to Boaz. We understand that he's a relative of Naomi. And he has the ability to take their family under his wings. And so we see Naomi recover from her long night of despondency And she exalts God in chapter 2 and says, The Lord's kindness has not forsaken me. She sees hope. Because Boaz might be the kinsman redeemer. A redeemer is one who, who pays for another. If you owe a debt and I pay your debt, I become your redeemer. In the Old Testament, a redeemer was one who was in the family. And a person in the family who was in debt who had no way of providing for themselves, someone in the family could come alongside them and become their kinsman redeemer, redeem the family. And so Naomi sees hope in that Boaz could be the kinsman redeemer if he were to marry Ruth. All the darkness of chapter 1 is gone. God has turned Naomi's mourning from the kindness of God has forsaken me or uh, dealt bitterly with me to the kindness has not forsaken me. And so the lesson in chapter 1 and chapter 2 is this. Seek refuge under the wings of God even when all the circumstances in your life seem to be dark. Even when everything seems to be not going well even when you're suffering, even when you're in the midst of trials and hardship, even when you don't have answers to all of your questions, seek refuge under the wings of God. For God is always working for your good and for his glory. Now for chapter 3. One of the questions chapter 3 helps address is, what does... A God-saturated man, Boaz, God-dependent young woman, Ruth, and a God-exalting older woman, Naomi, do when they are filled with hope in the sovereign goodness of God. And the answer is, their lives begin to express what I call strategic righteousness. Righteousness means that you have a passion, you have a zeal for doing what is right. You have a zeal and a passion to do things in your life that honor God. Strategic means that I'm intentional by what I do. I'm purposeful. I even plan what I'm going to do. There is such a thing as passive righteousness, (laughs) which means I simply sit in my home, in my church pew, and I try not to do evil. And I call that righteousness because I try not to sin, but I am not moving out into the world and trying to infect the world with goodness and kindness and holiness. 
Strategic righteousness takes the initiative and dreams how God might use you. Do you dream? I dream. Do you dream how God would use you? Most of you sitting here this morning are Christians. And so do you dream about how God might use you? That's what we see happening in this story. People dreaming of what God's plan might be for them. And then moving out in faith, not knowing if it's a right direction or a wrong direction, but they dream. I'm almost 70 years old, and Friday I was sitting in Starbucks, and I began to dream. I began to dream about this church and all the wonderful ways God has blessed this church, and I began to dream. I said, wouldn't it be exciting for this church to become a strategic place here in New England where young men could come and be trained how to do small town ministry, how to do ministry in rural America. I began to dream that. I don't know what God will do with that dream. My question to you this morning is, what are you dreaming about? How can God use you in your home? How God can use you in the community? How God might use you in your school or in your dorm? how God might use you in your place of work. One of the lessons I learned from Ruth, chapter 3, is that hope helps us dream. Hope helps us think of ways that God might use us. Hope helps us plan for ways that we might be used for God. It's hopelessness. It's hopelessness that makes people have to lie. It's hopelessness that makes people sin and steal. It's hopelessness that makes people do things that are illicit because their life are filled with the despair and so they think they have to manipulate their lives in order to make it comfortable rather than just trusting God. But hope based on the confidence that a sovereign God is for us, He is our refuge, He is our strength, That hope gives us a thrilling impulse for strategic righteousness, for dreaming how God might use us. If you haven't started dreaming about how God might use you, I would encourage you to begin that today. Let's talk about a little bit about Naomi. Two things stand out in Naomi's strategy. One is that Naomi has a strategy. The sheer fact that Naomi has a strategy teaches us something. People who are victims, people who feel depressed, have no hope, and because they have no hope, they usually have no plans. As long as Naomi was oppressed, as long as she could say, the Almighty has dealt bitterly bitterly with me, she conceived that her future had no future. I think one of the terrible effects of depression, we adults sometimes have bouts of depression. Students have bouts of depression. Young children have bouts of depression. It's real. And one of the terrible effects of depression is that you feel hopeless. And you don't know what the future has. And when people feel hopeless, they sometimes do very harmful things to themselves. But hope and trusting in God is the overflow of trusting in him. When Naomi awakens in chapter 2, 20, to the kindness of God, her hope becomes alive. And so she becomes concerned at the beginning of chapter 3 of finding a place to care for Ruth and to provide Ruth with security. And so she makes a plan. Hopeful people 
and hopeful churches make plans. They strategize how God might use them. <clears throat> churches and people who have no hope develop a strategy of just maintaining. How often have you been involved in a church where they're satisfied for just maintaining status quo because they're afraid they're a dying church and they're afraid they won't exist 10 years from now. And so they just work and work and work and work to maintain what is. But when a church feels the sovereign kindness of God hovering over them and moving in their midst, hope starts to thrive and righteousness ceases to be simply the avoidance of evil and becomes active and strategic of how your life as a community of believers might bring glory to God in this community, to this state and beyond. Naomi took the initiative to find a husband for Ruth, but the strategy she comes up with is kind of odd, to say the least. She says in verse 2 that Boaz is a kinsman, that in the Hebrew culture, he could play the, the role of goel, Hebrew word for redeemer. Therefore, he is the likely candidate for being Ruth's husband. And that way, the family name and the family inheritance could be preserved. So Naomi's aim is clear in these early verses, to win for Ruth a godly husband and secure a future and preserve the family life. So she tells Ruth to make herself clean and attractive as possible. She had been working out in the fields. She was in grubby clothes. So she says to Ruth, clean yourself up, put on nice clothes, and go down to the threshing floor where Boaz was working. And after he has fallen asleep, lie down at his feet. Lift up his cloak so his feet get cold and the coldness of the air will cause him to stir and eventually wake up. Now, everybody, including Ruth, must have responded by thinking, so if I go lay at the feet of Boaz, and I lift up his cloak so his feet are bare, and I lay down his feet, what do you suppose is going to happen, mother-in-law? <laughs> To which Naomi gives the extraordinary answer in verse 4. He will tell you what to do. <clears throat> and so next, we see Ruth's strategy. Ruth's strategic righteousness is seen in verse 6 and 9. In verse 5, she had said that she would follow all of Naomi's instructions. She's going to obey her mother-in-law and do everything that her mother-in-law has told her to do. But Ruth does more. Ruth, Naomi has said, that Boaz would tell Ruth what to do, but before that happens, Ruth tells Boaz why she has come. Ruth is lying on the threshing floor at the feet of Boaz's naked feet, and he awakes, and he says, who are you? And she answers with words that had been not prompted by her mother-in-law, her own words, she says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. And a more accurate translation in the Hebrew, different from your NIV, is spread your skirt over your maidservant, for you are next of kin. Ruth has gone willingly and now takes the initiative to make clear to Boaz why she is there. You are next of kin. Literally, that means you are my redeemer. You are the one who can redeem our inheritance and our family name from being lost. I want you to fill that role for me and our family. I want to be your wife. What she did and what she said was a marriage proposal. Interestingly, Ruth may have had a romantic interest in Boaz. She may have not. We're not really told. But Ruth's number one concern is for Naomi, her mother-in-law, to secure for her a goel. 
for her family, including herself, who can act as a redeemer. Now, <clears throat> there is something subtle going on in this passage, <clears throat> something subtle and profound that unless we understand the Hebrew culture, we don't pick up on. <clears throat> One is this. The only other place that you can find in the Old Testament where the phrase spreading the skirt occurs is in the book of Ezekiel. It's only used twice in all the Old Testament, spreading the skirt. And when it's used in Ezekiel, God is talking about his relationship with Ezekiel, but God talks about his relationship with Israel as a husband and as a wife, as a lover to his love mate. So listen to the words of Ezekiel 16, and it sounds like a lover, but it's really God talking to Israel, God expressing his love for Israel. So verse 8 reads this, When I passed by you again and looked upon you, behold, you were at the age for love, and I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Yea, I plighted my troth to you, and I entered in a covenant with you, says the Lord, and you became mine. If this is any indication of what Ruth wanted from Boaz, the request goes way beyond any hint of a sexual relationship. She was saying, in effect, I would like to be the one to whom you pledge your faithfulness and with whom you make a marriage covenant. I want you to be my redeemer, as God is redeemer for Israel. One other observation. When Ruth says, spread your skirt over me, the word skirt is the same Hebrew word for the word wing that was used not only in Ezekiel, but in verse 12 of chapter 2, when Boaz says to Ruth, the Lord recompense you for what you have done, <coughs> and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Under whose wings, under whose skirt you have come to take refuge. So Ruth is in essence asking Boaz to answer his own prayer back in chapter 2. The Lord recompense you, Boaz had prayed, and reward will be given to you, Boaz had prayed. So Ruth is saying, can I come under your wings? Can you act as my redeemer even as you prayed for me? So here's what I think is happening in chapter 3. Boaz is, is an older man. He's probably, most commentators say, he's probably 30 years older than Ruth, maybe even 40. It would not have been easy for an older man to express love to a younger woman in the Hebrew culture. It may have been even improper. And so I think Boaz did express his affection for Ruth, but he did it with deeds of kindness and subtle words of admiration. He said he admired her for coming under God's wings. And what I think Boaz was subtly saying is, because you have taken refuge under the wings of God, you are the kind of woman I want to cover with my wings. He acted in a subtle but profound way as though she were under his wings. But now he must wait for her to respond. So in the course of time, Ruth goes back and tells Naomi all that has happened. And so Ruth will come to him in his sleep in the grain field, and she will say, I will come under your wings. But she will say it 
in an equally subtle and profound way. She puts herself under his wings, so to speak, at his feet. And she is covered by his cloak. And he when wakes up, everything hangs on one sentence, whether Ruth has interpreted Boaz correctly. Ruth is taking a great risk. She's coming to this man who's much older her at night, thinking that she has understood his very subtle and profound ways of expressing his love for her, and she lies at his feet. And now she tells him why she came. And so what is Boaz going to say? <laughs> Imagine how fast her heart rate was racing. And then she says, I am Ruth. Spread your wings. Spread, spread your curt, skirt over your maidservant. <clears throat> there had to have been an immense silence for a moment while Boaz processed all those words. An older, aged man in love with a young widow whom he discreetly calls my daughter. A term of endearment communicating subtly, but in the best way he can, that he wants to be God's wings for her. And a young widow gradually reading between the lines and finally ready to risk an interpretation by coming in, in the middle of the night and taking refuge under the wing of his garment. That's powerful stuff. Anybody who thinks this is a loose woman and a finagling mother-in-law are at work here, you're on a different planet. All is subtle and all is very profound here, and it's strategic. And now comes the strategic righteousness of Boaz in verse 10. <clears throat> to hear what he says in the right way, you have to remember it's midnight. It's midnight, and he awakens lying under the stars, and he's looking into the eyes and into the face of a woman whom he loves. And he says to her, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness lying at his feet greater than the first in that you have not gone after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear, for I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of faith. And then comes some magnificent righteousness on the part of Boaz. He says to her, according to custom, there is another who has a prior claim to you, and I won't be able to proceed until all things are duly settled with him. In other words, in the family, there was another person who could also be Goel, a kinsman redeemer for Ruth and her mother-in-law and their family. There was another person who was a closer relative. And Boaz, rather than taking advantage of the situation, acts righteously and says, I'm willing to be your Goel. I'm willing to be your Redeemer. But there's one in line before me. And let me go to the town, to the elders, and make sure that no one else wants to be your Goel. And then I would happily be your Goel. Three quick applications. One, God blesses the upright. We are called as men and women of faith to be salt and light into this world. And we must desire that passionate zeal to be instruments of God's grace and mercy in the world. And that means we need to be working at reflecting holiness and goodness and kindness and mercy and love in our own lives. Secondly, believing in the providence of God 
knowing that God is in control of all things doesn't lead to fatalism. It doesn't mean that we operate our lives, sit back, and we do nothing because God's in control. Our faith must be active. In fact, again, the book of James says, our faith must be active if it is going to be true faith. And thirdly, in life, God calls you to walk by faith. Notice how this chapter ends. This is a beautiful, beautiful story to read. It sort of is, it always leaves you hanging. In chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3, you're left hanging. Because chapter 3 doesn't end with great clarity about what is going to happen. What is God going to do? Ruth does not know at the end of this chapter whether Boaz will become her redeemer or not. Naomi does not know if she's going to be provided for. So putting our faith in God does not mean we can always see the outcome. Sometimes we think when we pray that we ought to have an immediate answer. But faith in God does not mean we know what the outcome would be. Rather, faith in God gives us hope. It gives us confidence that God is in control. And why don't know the specific way this is going to turn out? I have a heart catheterization tomorrow. I don't know how it's going to turn out. But my hope is in God and confidence in God that God's plan will be worked out in my life. And so we learn from this that we need to serve the Lord, we need to walk by faith, and we need to trust God. For He is our refuge and our strength. And lastly, just as Boaz preserved the name and place of Elimelech in Israel, Jesus is sent to be our Redeemer, to restore our name, and to give us an eternal inheritance. What do we read in John chapter 1? Yet all who received him, Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Boaz prefigures Jesus. Boaz comes into the life of these two poor women to redeem them. Jesus comes into our life, even though we're unworthy, we're unholy, we're sinners. He comes into our life to redeem us so that he might call us sons and daughters of the Most High God. You are, if you trust in Jesus, you are a daughter of the King of Kings. You are a son of the King of Kings. You are a child of God, and the Lord God is your heavenly Father. Jesus says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God's promise to you is if you trust in Jesus, even though your body dies, yet you live. And you live with Jesus for all eternity, because he is your heavenly Father. We're going to come to the table this morning, and this table represents bread, the body of Jesus, and juice, representing the blood of Jesus. It serves as a reminder that we're unworthy to come before God, that we're sinners, and we needed someone to pay the price for our sins, even Jesus. And when we place our faith in Him, He calls us His children, and He gives us eternal life. Jesus is the fulfillment of the kinsman redeemer portrayed in Boaz. Jesus is our redeemer. He is our goel. He, in his death and resurrection, redeems us so that we might hear from him the same words Boaz used for Ruth. Blessed are you of the Lord. Do not fear. I will do for you all that you have requested. I will redeem you.
Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning. And we give you thanks for this morning, for the Bible, for the wonderful way it paints with pictures what you have been doing throughout all history of preparing a Redeemer for us, even Jesus our Lord. And so, Father, we come to you this morning and we give you thanks for sending Jesus, our Goel, our Redeemer. But we come, Father, and we come humbly knowing that we're not worthy for we've sinned. But we thank you for your grace and your mercy. You have forgiven us all of our sins upon the cross. For that we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand as we prepare to sing? I stand amazed.